Welcome to intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are going to be different than everything we've talked about up to this point because up to this point we've been discussing what are known as intramolecular forces. So for instance, if I have a uh, water molecule, I've told you that um, we have you know, covalent bonds in between this and we've described what those bonds are like and so forth, whether it's a transfer or a sharing of electrons. But that's all happening within a single molecule. Now what we're going to do is actually talk about how there are multiple molecules and how these things can interact with each other. And those interactions between molecules are known as intermolecular forces. Now these are going to be um, quite important because this actually helps to determine why things are gases, liquids, or solids. So just as a quick refresher um, about the differences between gas, liquids, and solids, um, gases, they will always expand to take the shape and volume of their container. They have a random disorganized um, arrangement of, of atoms or particles within those gases, and there's a lot of empty space in between the gas particles. The density is extremely low, those particles are moving very, very fast, and we are considering that there's no um, attractive or repulsive force between those molecules because there's just simply so much empty space between them. Now a liquid, on the other hand, has a fixed volume, but it will take the shape of whatever container it's in. It still has um, molecules or, or atoms or particles that are randomly arranged, but they are very close together, much, much, much closer than gases are. This leads to a very high density, or at least to a high density. Um, moderate particle movement because the atoms or molecules are allowed to slide past each other, but there's still a strong interactive force between the molecules. And then we have the solids, which have a fixed shape and a fixed volume. They have a fixed arrangement of the particles, which are then very, very tightly packed together. They have an extremely high density because there's just simply so much stuff in there. They have um, a little bit of particle movement, but it's mostly just vibrations within that fixed arrangement. And because of all of this, we have an extremely strong interactive force between those particles. But what's important for us to remember here is that whether a substance is a gas, liquid, or a solid depends on two factors. The first is the amount of kinetic energy between the molecules, or in other words, um, you know, the temperature, right? I can have H2O, and it can be a liquid, a solid, or a gas, um, all depending on simply the temperature. And then the other thing that we need to be concerned with are the intermolecular forces, and that's where this section comes in. In a previous section, we spent a lot of time discussing gases, and so this section mostly focuses on liquids with a bit of solids thrown in there. But um, what are some of the properties of liquids that are different than those of gases? Well, one of these is what's known as surface tension. This is the tendency of liquids to, you know, minimize their surface area. All right, uh, liquids actually behave as though they, they have a skin. So um, let me give you an example of this. If you look at your windshield when it rains, you have this nice flat glass surface, and the molecules of water will actually pull together, and they'll actually form this nice little droplet. If something has a very, very low surface tension, for instance, if it were raining um, acetone or fingernail polish remover, the droplets wouldn't look like that, like not nice little beads. Instead, they'd be, you know, very flat, spread out. Um, so water has a high surface tension. It kind of pulls in on itself. This is also why those little water bugs, I call them water skeeters. I don't know what you call them, water striders or water bugs. Um, but they can kind of float right on top of the the water, and to them, the, the water actually seems like a little trampoline because it has such a high surface tension. It pulls together, and they can kind of just float right on top of that. If you really, really hate those little water bugs, um, you could always dump a little dish soap into the, into the pond or whatever. They'd all plummet to a watery grave. I don't know why you'd hate um, water skeeters that, or water bugs that much, but you could if you really wanted to. Now, um, what's the, the next property we should discuss? Well, the next one would be viscosity, which is a, a liquid's resistance to flow. So, for instance, think of honey or molasses. Right? They have a very high viscosity. Uh, they're very difficult to, to pour out. And this all has to do with how tightly the molecules hold on to each other. 
Now the next property that we should be concerned with is known as evaporation, right? And we all know about this. This is what happens when you spill a little bit of um, water on the kitchen floor and you're too lazy to actually you know, grab a towel and wipe it up. So instead you just let it evaporate, right? Um, <laughs> this is also known as vaporization. And so this is how a liquid can turn into a gas or a vapor. Now what's actually happening is the the water molecules, in the case of my kitchen floor, are bouncing into each other and ricocheting off of each other. And every now and then, one really thwacks another water molecule with just enough energy that it can actually break free from the surface of the liquid and turn into a vapor and float off into space. Um, that actually cools the remaining, of the remaining liquid molecules because the escaping vapor molecules are carrying with them a bunch of of gas. This is why we sweat, right? Because as we sweat, our sweat evaporates, which then you know cools our body. Um, you can also feel the same thing if you take one of those alcohol swabs and rub it on your skin, you know, like when you're getting a vaccine and so forth. You can feel as it evaporates, it, it feels cool. Now, why is it that if you spill some water on the floor, it can evaporate pretty quickly, or if you spill something like fingernail polish uh, remover on the floor, acetone, it'll also evaporate pretty quickly. Same thing with alcohol, but other things like motor oil won't evaporate at all. They just sit there in a big puddle for years and years. Well, that's because um, motor oil is what's known as non-volatile. It evaporates extremely slowly. The others would be considered volatile liquids. They evaporate quickly. Now, um, if I do spill some water on the floor and I want it to evaporate quickly, what can I do to speed this up? Well, one thing I could do is I could increase the temperature. So I could go and I could crank the, the thermostat because by increasing the temperature I'm giving all of those molecules a bit more kinetic energy. I'm raising the average kinetic energy which means there's a greater likelihood that um, something's actually going to um, ricochet into one of those water molecules and cause it to have enough energy to actually leave the surface of the liquid. The next thing I could do is I could increase the surface area. So by spreading out the, the liquid, the water itself, spreading it all over the floor, that allows you know, more water molecules to be in contact with the surface, which increases the likelihood that they could break free from the surface. So both of those would allow me to evaporate my liquid more quickly. You know, because I, obviously that seems like far less work than actually just grabbing a paper towel and mopping it up, right? Now, if evaporation is the, the changing of a liquid into a gas or a vapor, condensation would be the opposite. So this would be when a, a vapor or a gas uh, turns back into a liquid. And this can happen, especially if you have like a nice closed container. Let's say you leave your water bottle, your half-empty water bottle in the car on a hot day. You can actually see as the water molecules evaporate, and then they can sometimes collide with each other because they're trapped within that that water bottle and aren't free to just escape into the atmosphere. So they can actually collide with each other or collide with the surface of the liquid and then those can actually rejoin the liquid itself and that's called condensation. Now if you have a closed system like a water bottle these two processes can be in you know opposition to each other, right? So water molecules are evaporating but then they're also condensing. And at some point, you actually reach what we call dynamic equilibrium, where these two rates are happening simultaneously, but they're happening at the same speed or the same rate. And so um, you have things evaporating, but you have things condensing, and so you don't notice any net change in the, the volume of your liquid. I always think of this as backwash, right? So when uh, you know you, my kids would ask for a glass of water, um, and I'd notice that I note the level of the water when I hand them the glass of water, and I'd see the water going into their mouth, and yet somehow when they handed the glass of water back, the water level would be the exact same, except now there's chunkies in it, right? And so that would be equilibrium, right? Things going in, things going out at the same rate. Now, because this is happening, and because we are creating a vapor that's trapped within the bottle, um, that vapor is a gas, right? And that vapor exerts a pressure, just like all gases do, and we call that the vapor pressure. Now, you might be a little bit confused because this is, uh, you know, kind of strange, but what's the, the difference between evaporation and boiling? 
Well, a couple of important things. Evaporation only occurs at the surface, right? I mentioned that if I want to speed up the evaporation of the, the drink I spilled on the floor, I need to increase the surface area because that allows more of those molecules to break free from the surface. Boiling actually occurs throughout the liquid. So um, any molecule in an entire pot of water is at a certain temperature or an average temperature and, is, and can actually boil at that point. The other difference is that evaporation can occur at any temperature, whereas boiling only occurs at the boiling point, right? hence the name of the boiling point. So for instance, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, which is you know, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, right? That's pretty hot. And so if I want to boil a pot of water, I have to put in a lot of heat, whereas I can spill some water on my kitchen floor and I don't have to suddenly crank up the thermostat to boiling, right? I don't have to heat it all the way up to 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit in order for that water to evaporate. In fact, even on a cold day, water will still slowly evaporate as some molecules happen to be jostled just enough that they can actually break free from the surface of the liquid. Now, the boiling point is the temperature at which things boil, but more precisely, it's the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So if I'm at sea level, um, the average atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. And so the, um, the vapor pressure of the liquid, of the water, actually has to reach one atmosphere in order to, to boil. So we call that the normal boiling point. All right, it's kind of, it makes sense, right? It's just the, the, the normal temperature at which things boil. But the boiling point can change. If you read the back of your brownies mix, it'll say high altitude directions. And that's because at higher altitudes, there's less atmosphere above you, therefore less atmospheric pressure. And therefore, things actually boil at a lower temperature than they would at sea level. And so instead of boiling at 100 degrees Celsius, maybe the water boils at 98 degrees Celsius, right? It really depends on, on the atmospheric pressure. And so therefore, you have to adjust your cooking time slightly. In fact, at you know up in the high mountains, it can actually be really difficult to boil an egg because the water boils at such a low temperature that your egg just doesn't cook. It takes forever to actually cook this. And so um, the way that you can use this to your advantage, this whole idea of boiling points changing, is you can use a pressure cooker. If you've ever seen a pressure cooker, it's kind of like a, a crock pot. You put everything in there, but then you actually clamp on the lid. And by doing that, um, you're trapping things in a closed container. And as the water boils, it creates a lot of pressure, which then increases the atmospheric pressure above it because it can't escape. And therefore, the water won't, you know, the remaining water won't boil until maybe 150 degrees Celsius or 250 degrees Fahrenheit or some crazy temperature. And so your food actually cooks much faster. But they can be a bit dangerous because if that lid ever does blow, um, it's going to um, explode all over the place. Now most of these I'm sure you've heard of and are very familiar with, but I just want to quickly point out you know, just a few definitions. One is that if you are um, melting something, that means you're going from a solid to a liquid. If you're freezing someone, you're freezing something, you're going from a liquid to a solid. And it turns out that melting something is endothermic, which makes a lot of sense, right? You have to put heat into it. That's what endothermic means. So if I want to melt an ice cube, I have to heat it up. So it's endothermic. But because freezing is the opposite process, then freezing is actually an exothermic process, which is why if you look at the back of your freezer, you have these um, coils there, right? Those cooling coils. Because you can think of it that the freezer is taking out the heat, right? sucking out the heat of you know, your otter pops or freezer pops or whatever, and it has to take that heat and put it somewhere so it vents it through the back, which is why you should always have a couple of inches of clearance between the back of your fridge and the wall because you want some air to be able to circulate back there. This is also why orange growers in Florida, if there's going to be an early frost, they'll oftentimes get like a fire hose and go spray down their orange trees with water, which seems kind of weird. Um, but as the water freezes, that heat actually goes into the oranges, and it actually keeps the oranges from freezing and splitting open and ruining the, the crop. 
Now, what about some other processes that are kind of opposites? Well, evaporation, we mentioned, um, is going from a liquid to a gas. This is endothermic because you have to put heat into it. And then condensation is going from a gas back into a liquid. And this is exothermic. Heat's released from this. You know this if you've ever actually um, had a steam burn. <laughs> this happens to me all the time because every time I'm making like chocolate chip cookies or whatever, I look in the, you know, I go and I open the oven and I stick my face in to see if they're done. And without fail, I get this big blast of steam. And um, I don't know why I don't learn, but as the steam condenses on my face, all of that heat has to go somewhere and it goes into my skin and gives me a nasty burn. And then something else that you might not be so familiar with because it's not as common is what's known as sublimation. This is going from a solid straight into a gas without going through the liquid phase. This is something like dry ice will do this. It's solid carbon dioxide turning into carbon dioxide gas without going through the liquid phase. Mothballs also do this. Um, if you go to your grandma's house and it smells funny, it might be mothballs, which is naphthalene. They're actually uh, carcinogenic, so you shouldn't use those. Um, I've heard that some people actually put them in their garden to keep the deer away. Kind of a bad idea. I wouldn't do that either. The opposite of sublimation would be deposition. This is from a, going from a gas straight into a solid without going through the liquid phase. You can imagine that uh, sublimation is endothermic. And deposition would be exothermic. All right, so we've gone through a bunch of the basics, but let's actually start discussing the intermolecular forces themselves because that's the name of the section, right? So again, intermolecular forces are the attractive forces that exist between molecules. There are three of these that we should be concerned with. From weakest to strongest, these are London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, and hydrogen bonding. And I'm going to go through each of these in a little more detail. So London dispersion forces. All right, these are extremely weak um, interactions that are caused by temporary changes in electron density in a molecule. What does that mean? Well, this means that um, all molecules have this kind of electron cloud surrounding them, right? We don't know exactly where the electrons are, but they're kind of just, you know, smooshing around within this molecule. Now, remember that electrons are negative, correct? So if I bring two molecules together, the electrons that are in one molecule will actually repel the electrons that are found in the other molecule. And so the electrons might be like, oh, here I'm on the right-hand side of the molecule. I'm going to kind of you know, push or repel the electrons in the other molecule so that they get as far away from me as possible. And so you, instead of having like this nice even distribution, you actually end up with something um, like this shown on the right. So remember that the Greek letter delta means partial. So here you can see that the electrons are on the left-hand side of this molecule. They've kind of gushed over to one side, and they've given this half of the molecule a slight negative charge. That means that the right-hand side of the molecule has a slight positive charge. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and put that in a different color, just so that you can see that this side is slightly positive. All right. Now, what does that do? Well, that means that that side's going to go ahead and attract the electrons from this side, and so you get this slight interactive force, right? The slight attractive force between those two sides of the molecules. Now, this is an extremely weak attractive force because this is completely temporary, right? In an instant, uh, these m electrons are moving to another part of the molecule and then suddenly you no longer have this attractive force. So what you should be aware of are a couple of things. One is that London dispersion forces are incredibly weak. All right. Um, I always think of it that London Bridge is falling down, you know, the old song, right? Which means it must be an extremely weak bridge because it's always falling down all the time, right? Every time kids sing that song. So therefore, London dispersion forces must be extremely weak forces. The second thing that you should remember is that all molecules exhibit London dispersion forces. Um, every one, right? So if I asked you, you know, I listed five molecules and said, which of the following exhibit London dispersion forces? You'd say all of the above because all molecules exhibit London dispersion forces. Some people just call these London forces, some call them dispersion forces, some call them van der Waals forces, um, a bunch of different names for the same thing. Now, um, if I have a couple of molecules and the only thing they exhibit are London dispersion forces, no dipole-dipole and no hydrogen bonds, then 
um, it turns out that the larger molecule will have stronger dispersion forces, which makes sense. A larger molecule has more electrons. More electrons means more of this, you know, very weak attractive force between molecules. You can actually see this in action with the noble gases. So these are gases that only exhibit, you know, London dispersion forces. And as we, um, as we actually liquefy these, you can find out that their, their boiling point um, is extremely, extremely low because they have only dispersion forces. But notice that I go from something like um, helium, which has a molar mass of 4 and has a boiling point of about 4.2 Kelvin. I go up to xenon that has a much, much, much larger mass, 131.29 grams per mole. And look, I've increased the, the boiling point by about 160 Kelvin. So, uh, you know, again, if, if I have dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding, that's going to trump all of the dispersion forces. But if I have multiple molecules that only have dispersion forces, then look for the larger one. That's going to have the higher uh, melting point and the higher boiling point. So let me go ahead and give you some examples, or I should say kind of like a pop quiz here. So which of the following molecules would have a higher um, boiling point or higher melting point? Which one has stronger attractive forces? Well, let me first mention that all of these have only London dispersion forces. They do not have anything else going on here. So um, which one, C4H10 or CH4? Well, which one's larger? C4H10, right? It has four carbons instead of just one. So a much larger molecule. What about CO2 versus CS2? Hmm, same number of atoms. But if I look at my periodic table, I see that sulfur is a much larger atom than oxygen. Oxygen has a mass of 16. Sulfur has a mass of 32. Therefore, CS2 is going to be the larger molecule and have a higher melting point and a higher boiling point. What about BF3 versus BCl3? Same thing. Boron's the same in both cases, but chlorine is a much larger atom than fluorine. And so therefore, BCl3 would have higher um, <laughs> intermolecular forces or attractive forces. It would have a higher melting point and a higher boiling point. London dispersion forces, again, would be the weakest of the three types of intermolecular attractive forces we're discussing. So the next one would be dipole-dipole forces or dipole-dipole interactions. Now, if you remember from when we were discussing drawing molecules, I mentioned that a dipole exists when you have a polar molecule. Right? That means that one end of the molecule has a much higher electronegativity, and so the electrons are pulled to that side, kind of in this unequal tug-of-war. That's what's happening here with our um, formaldehyde molecule. You can see that oxygen, well, you can't really see it, but oxygen has a, a much higher electronegativity. If we were to look at an electronegativity scale, uh, much higher than the hydrogens. And so therefore, the electrons are getting pulled towards the oxygen side of the molecule. Now what this does is it creates a permanent dipole. This is different from the London dispersion forces where we had a temporary dipole or an induced dipole where the electron shifted just temporarily. This is um, permanent, and so the one side of the molecule always has a slight negative charge. The other side always has a slight positive charge. So what this means is that you will get some attractive force in between the slight negative side of one molecule and the slight positive side of the other molecule. And this is enough that, you know, this is a pretty decent force that helps to pull these molecules together. All right, so that's a dipole-dipole. It exists only between polar molecules. All right, so which molecules exhibit London forces? All molecules. Which molecules exhibit pol uh, ex <laughs> Sorry, which molecules exhibit dipole-dipole? Polar molecules. And then the last would be hydrogen bonding. This is actually a, a specific type of dipole-dipole, but it's so strong that we give it another name. We call this hydrogen bonding. And this occurs whenever you have a hydrogen atom that is directly attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. All right. um, so it has to be a hydrogen specifically attached directly to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. All right. um, if you want to remember those, 
uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine are all right next to each other on the top right hand side of the periodic table or you could rearrange it and spell phone and you can't live without your phone right so therefore <laughs> I don't know anyway but um, you should remember that these are very very strong hydrogen bonding right and so what's happening here is that nitrogen oxygen and fluorine have extremely high electronegativities so when you have a hydrogen attached to one of those atoms the hydrogens really left out in the cold with a you know a relatively strong partial positive charge whereas the oxygen nitrogen or fluorine has a, a relatively strong partial negative all right so um, and this is actually what's happening between water molecules that allows them to have this nice um, hexagonal crystal structure that forms um, snowflakes right so when the mo water molecules slow down enough that they get you know they're getting colder and colder they slow down the hydrogen bonds take over and it you know forces them to arrange themselves in a nice pattern uh, apparently the one that I drew kind of looks like a, um, a fish here but <laughs> it's like a little goldfish give it an eye and some gills or something and call it good anyway globe 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 all right so um, hydrogen bonding is by far the strongest of the three intermolecular forces much stronger than uh, dipole dipole and much 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 stronger than London dispersion forces So why do we care about intermolecular forces? Well, it turns out that the stronger the intermolecular forces you have in a molecule, the higher the melting point will be, the higher the boiling point will be, the higher the viscosity will be, the higher the surface tension, but the lower the vapor pressure. Because remember that having a strong um, intermolecular force means that the molecules pull on to each other, right? They hang on to each other, so they don't want to melt, they don't want to boil, they they don't want to let go of each other so there's a high viscosity and a high surface tension but because they are hanging on so tightly to each other they don't evaporate quickly which means there aren't going to be as many molecules in the gas phase or the vapor phase which means you're going to have a lower vapor pressure so um, before I uh, go ahead and show you uh, an example of this let me let me show you a quick illusion just for fun alright so um, normally I'd have you choose a card, but because you're not here, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, choose a card for you. Does that seem fair? All right, so I'm just going to cut the deck wherever, and I have my handy little tool here to demonstrate intermolecular um, forces in a card. All right, so let's go ahead and check out the card that you just chose. Um, the one that you cut to was this one, and it looks like a queen of clubs. So if I go ahead and put that card into this you can see that I can move it from one side to the other amazing right well the the cool thing is is I can actually slide that center piece from one side to the other all right you can see it front and back so it's like chopping a, a woman in half but a little less messy now the reason that this works is because the intermolecular forces within the card are actually fairly weak all right if it had very strong intermolecular forces, I wouldn't be able to break that apart. All right? All right, so now let's go ahead and have some more fun and look at an example of, of this, right? So I give you a couple of molecules here, CH4, CH2O, and NH3. And I might ask you any of the following questions, right? I could ask you which one has the highest boiling point or the highest viscosity or the highest vapor pressure or whatever, right? But for any problem like this, the first thing I need to do is to actually draw out the molecule. Now, if you need a refresher on how to draw these things, you should go back and look at the drawing molecules section because it will explain this to you. But I'm just going to quickly oops, draw each of these molecules. Now, we need the Lewis dot structure for each one if we are to figure out what kind of intermolecular forces we have within the molecule. Okay, so I've gone ahead and drawn each of those molecules. Now, the next question would be, which of these molecules exhibit London dispersion forces? And you should know by now that all of them do, right? Because they are molecules, and all molecules exhibit dispersion forces. What about dipole-dipole? We are looking for polar molecules.
remember that a polar molecule has, you know, one of these things is not like the other. So if I look at the, the carbon here, it has one, two, three, four things around it. They are all the exact same. Therefore, this is not a polar molecule and does not have dipole-dipole. What about the second one? The carbon in the center has one, two, three things around it, and one of them is an oxygen, very different from the others. Therefore, this is polar. What about ammonia here on the end? Well, I have one, two, three, four things around that nitrogen, and one of them is a lone pair. And so that's different, so therefore that's a polar molecule. Now what about hydrogen bonding? Remember for hydrogen bonding, I'm looking for a hydrogen directly attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Um, in this first one, CH4, I have hydrogens, but I do not have a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, so that doesn't work. What about this second one? Hmm, I do have an oxygen and a hydrogen, but they're not directly bonded to each other. They're bonded to the carbon, so no hydrogen bonding here. And then the third one, sure enough, I have a hydrogen directly bonded to a nitrogen, so therefore this one does exhibit hydrogen bonding. So, in answer to the questions over here on the left-hand side, which one has the highest boiling point? Well, I'm looking for the one with the strongest attractive forces. Ammonia has hydrogen bonding, therefore that's going to have the highest boiling point. It'll also have the highest melting point. Um, what about the highest viscosity? Again, I'm looking for strongest attractive forces. Hydrogen bonding trumps everything else. So ammonia means, again, it would also have the highest surface tension. What about the highest vapor pressure? Well, this is the opposite trend, right? I'm looking for really weak attractive forces because that means it will evaporate quickly, produce a lot of vapor, which exerts a lot of pressure. So notice that CH4 only has London dispersion forces. Um, the other ones have dipole-dipole and or hydrogen bonding. And so CH4 would actually have the lowest vapor pressure, or sorry, the highest vapor pressure. It would also have the lowest boiling point, the lowest viscosity, the lowest melting point, the lowest surface tension, the lowest everything else, but the highest vapor pressure. Now I did mention that uh, we'd go over a little bit of solids here at the end of the section. So um, solids can actually be classified in one of two categories, either crystalline or amorphous solids. And as the name implies, crystalline solids are crystalline, right? They're made of crystals. They're made of a nice, ordered, uh, repeating pattern of particles, right? Um, now, this could be something like a diamond or table salt or sugar crystals, right? Any of the, of the above, right? Um, now, amorphous solids are different. These are the ones that have no regular arrangement of particles. So these are often kind of not quite solid -y, if that were even a word. Think of something like silly putty. Right, it, it kind of flows a little bit. It's almost like a liquid, but not quite. It's definitely a solid, but it's kind of somewhere in between. Uh, rubber, glass would also be examples of amorphous solids. Now, crystalline solids can be subdivided even further into either molecular, ionic, or atomic solids. Molecular solids are made of molecules. What this means is that we have only nonmetals. Right, so think of water or sucrose, C12H22O11, right? Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, they're all nonmetals. They're all in the top right-hand corner of the periodic table, except for hydrogen, which is that oddball one, but they're all nonmetals. So those would be molecular solids. Ionic solids are made of ions. So this would be something that has a metal and at least one nonmetal. So sodium chloride, lithium nitrate, potassium sulfate, right? Potassium's a metal from the left-hand side of the table, Sulfur and oxygen are nonmetals from the top right hand corner of the table. So those would be ionic solids. And then atomic solids would be uh, pretty much everything else. These would be just made of um, individual atoms, right? They're not bonded to anything else, just themselves. So xenon, gold, iron, right? Notice that in the formula there, iron is just iron, it doesn't have anything else attached to it. So that would be an atomic solid. So, uh, let's go ahead and try a quick pop quiz. Um, what are the following compounds? Um, are they molecular, ionic, or atomic solids? Water. Well, hydrogen and oxygen, only nonmetals, right? So that would be a molecular uh, compound, right? Or a molecular solid. Same thing with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, only nonmetals. Must be molecular as well. What about potassium fluoride? 
Well, potassium is a metal from the left-hand side of the table. Fluoride's a nonmetal from the top right. That must be ionic. How about aluminum? Well, it's just aluminum by itself, right? That would be an atomic solid. Aluminum chloride, however, contains aluminum, which is a metal, and chlorine, which is a nonmetal. So that would be ionic. And then carbon monoxide is made of just carbon and oxygen, two nonmetals. Therefore, that must be molecular. So remember, molecular contains only nonmetals. Ionic typically contains a metal and then one or more nonmetals. And then atomic solids would be those that are just made of just single atoms, right? Not bonded to any other elements. Now, it turns out that we can actually classify um, atomic solids in three different ways. These could either be covalent solids. This is where they are actually attached to each other by covalent bonds, which means that every atom is attached to every other atom. So this is something like diamond. Diamond is just carbon, right? And yet each carbon atom is covalently bonded to four other carbon atoms, which are then bonded to four other carbon atoms, which are bonded to four other carbon atoms. In fact, um, a, if you have a diamond, that diamond is actually just one giant molecule, which is kind of cool to think about, right? Um, graphite is also just carbon. However, each carbon atom is only bonded to three other carbon atoms, and so they form layers uh, rather than like a giant um, molecule, right? And so those layers can slide past each other, which is how pencil lead works. It's graphite. And as you run your pencil along the paper, the friction causes layers of that graphite to slide off of the, uh, the pencil and onto the paper. And then quartz, which is silicon dioxide, or SiO2, um, this is the main component of sand, and uh, this is also a covalent solid. So those are really the only three that are common. There are some other weird ones out there, you know, silicon carbides and crazy things, but the three common ones that I might, you know, um, try to trick you with would be diamond, graphite, and quartz. So if it's not one of those, it's not a covalent solid. They're not terribly common. Non-bonding solids, as the name implies, don't bond to each other, right? So this would be something like a, a noble gas, where they're held together only by London dispersion forces. As you can imagine, these would have really low melting points and boiling points because of just the, the dispersion forces themselves. Covalent solids, on the other hand, because they are held together by covalent bonds, which are very strong, typically have a much higher melting point, boiling point. And then metallic solids, these are metals. They're held together by metallic bonds. So something like silver, calcium, tin, lead, gold, those are all metals. So if I have something like aluminum foil, all of those aluminum atoms are held to all the other aluminum atoms via something called metallic bonds. And metallic bonds are a little bit weird uh, because what's actually happening is you have the little... Uh, nuclei of the, let's say, gold, if you have a gold ring, and these are positively charged nuclei that are just kind of hanging out. And then, within that, you have a whole bunch of um, electrons, okay? And these electrons are kind of free to, to roam wherever they want. So it's kind of like a, like a little islands in the ocean, right? with the electrons kind of flowing all over the place. And the electrons are just free-ranging all over. It's kind of like when you go to the, the grocery store or the toy store, and some parents just let their kids kind of like free-range wherever, just like, all right, just little Billy, go run off and play in aisle seven or something. And so they're all over the place. Um, so that's a lot like metallic bonding, where the electrons aren't held tightly to a single nucleus. They're actually just kind of free-range, allowed to go wherever they want which is why metals happen to conduct electricity um, so well. It's because the electrons are free to go from one side of the, you know, the wire to the other because they're not held in place. They're not held within bonds the way they would be with you know, covalent solids or ionic compounds and so forth. So you go ahead and tell me, uh, what are the following? Are they covalent, non-bonding, or metallic solids? Neon. Well, neon's a noble gas. It's definitely not covalent. It's not one of those ones that I mentioned. So, and it's not metallic, right? So it must be, um, must be a non-bonding. All right. So that one would be non-bonding. Oops. 
wrong pen there, non-bonding. Okay, what about lithium? If you look at the periodic table, lithium is a metal on the left-hand side, so it must be metallic bonding. Same thing with copper. Copper is a metal, so it must be metallic. And then diamond. Ah, diamond's one of those few covalent solids that I mentioned. Right, there aren't too many of these, but diamond's definitely one of them. And that actually wraps it up for intermolecular forces. So, um, you know, thanks again for, for listening, and I will catch you next time.